Hi, I'm Lisa Fletcher, and this is The Stream's online pre-show. Today we're talking about government whistleblowers and the use of classified leaks. Here with us in studio is Jesslyn Raddick. She is the National Security and Human Rights Director for the Government Accountability Project. That is the leading whistleblower protection group in the United States. Jesslyn, welcome. Hi, thank you. So you have provided legal representation for government whistleblowers. You're a whistleblower yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, set up a framework for us. Uh, tell us about your whistleblower case, personally. In my case, I had been the Justice Department ethics advisor um, when we captured John Walker Lind, who was called the American Taliban, and he was our first capture in Afghanistan. And I had advised against interrogating him without counsel and certainly parenthetically against torturing him. Um, when I found out that my advice was withheld from the court in contravention of a court order mm. for all Justice Department correspondence, I blew the whistle um, so the information would be out there. And in turn, I ended up being put under criminal investigation and referred to the state bars in which I'm licensed as an attorney and put on the no-fly list. Um, that gave, you know, made me interested in representing and helping other whistleblowers. So it came as a real shock now in this administration to see that people are not only getting fired and forced from their jobs and um, blacklisted and bankrupted, they're now actually facing jail. It, it is interesting whistle. because it's something that I think a lot of people wouldn't expect out of the Obama administration. No, certainly not. I mean, he came into office pledging uh, to protect whistleblowers and called them courageous and patriotic, but has led a brutal campaign um, prosecuting them um, as enemies of the state which is one of the most serious charges you can level against an American. Uh, being a traitor, which is the title of your book, Traitor, the Whistleblower yep. and the American Taliban. Tell us a little bit about that. Um, in Traitor, I talk about my own case juxtaposed with the torture memos and the evolution of the torture program as it unfolded over the years. Um, so I juxtapose those two. And um, in the end of my book, I also talk about the case of NSA whistleblower Thomas Drake, mm -hmm. um, who was the first person, um, well, the fourth person in U.S. history to be prosecuted under the Espionage Act, and that case completely collapsed um, with all 10 felony counts being dropped. So we hear what happened to you, but do you know what happened to whoever it was that, uh, you know, took out your information, your advice for John Walker Lynn to have, you know, mm -hmm. legal yeah. counsel? Everyone in my case ended up um, being promoted or um, going on to teach at prominent universities or becoming a federal judge. Um, the authors of the torture memos, my classmate John Yu is a tenure professor at Berkeley. Jay, Jay Bybee, his boss, is a federal judge. Um, Mike Chertoff, um, certainly uh, he's with the Chertoff group now and enjoying a very lucrative contracting right. benefit. Uh, how does so. that happen, Jesslyn? You know, I think, unfortunately, there's kind of this screw up, cover up, get promoted ethos in Washington, and you get rewarded for towing the party line. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why a lot of people keep their mouths shut. Um, you know, Tom Drake was told, look, everyone's going to get a piece of the pie. We're getting a lot of money at NSA after 9-11. Mm -hmm. We're going to milk this for all it's worth, and you're going to get your share. Just play along. And it's definitely an easier path to take to just go along rather than to end up possibly losing your liberty for for talking about what's wrong. You still on the no-fly list? You know, I, I was removed from the no-fly list um, and then I recently um, had difficulty flying, I think, because I had met with Jul Julian Assange recently. Mm -hmm. So I so took a now picture. Now you might be back on it? Well, <sighs> I'm afraid I might be back on it. Um, we did have a boarding pass printed with right. the four S's. So. We're going to hold you right there. Mm -hmm. Show's about to start in sure. 10 seconds, so stick around for the stream. I'm Lisa Fletcher, and you're in the stream. Today, classified leaks and government whistleblowers. Does the Obama administration have a double standard when it comes to revealing state secrets?
Our digital producer, Malika Bilal, will bring in as much of your live feedback as she can during the program, so tweet her, use the hashtag AJStream. Malika, our, our community really leaning in favor uh, of protecting whistleblowers. They definitely are. And so we asked the question, do you think that the U.S. government is doing enough to protect the rights of whistleblowers? The hacktivist group Anonymous replied to us with this tweet, and they linked to this photo, uh, summing up their feelings, the hysterical laughter of uh, Nicolas Cage, Hollywood actor, uh, pretty much sums it up that they thought the question was laughable. So for those of you at home, we'd like to know your thoughts, whether or not you agree with Anonymous's view or not. Let us know by using the hashtag AJStream. Joining us in studio is Jesslyn Raddick. She is the National Security and Human Rights Director for the Government Accountability Project, the leading whistleblower protection group in the United States. Jesslyn is herself a whistleblower who exposed government misconduct in the case of John Walker Lind, the first terrorism prosecution in the U.S. after 9-11. She's also one of the attorneys representing John Kiriakou, whose story we're going to hear shortly. Jesslyn, welcome to the stream. Thank you for having me. Now, if you want to add your voice to this conversation, send us a tweet. Or better yet, send us a video comment through our website. Just go to stream.aljazeera.com, click on that red button right there that says record, and then leave us a 30-second message. It's an easy way for you to be in the stream. Hi, my name is Fiona Madrid. I go to the basis DC and I love the performing arts and I'm in the stream. The Obama administration has pursued a record number of cases against government employees who have leaked classified details to expose wrongdoing. Using a World War I era espionage act, the U.S. Department of Justice in the past several years has gone after at least six government whistleblowers, including those who have spoken out against torture and government waste. And it's worth noting that Obama has invoked the 1917 Spy Act a record number of times, more than all U.S. administrations combined. At the same time, critics say no one has been prosecuted for leaks that have benefited Obama politically. Best-selling books, page one stories in the New York Times, and now even a movie portraying the so-called war on terror in a positive light, all of those included the use of leaked classified information. So, is there a double standard? And where do you draw the line between leaks that threaten national security and leaks that improve government transparency? Joining us from Virginia is John Kiriakou. He was a CIA analyst and officer for 14 years and the agency's first employee to speak publicly against the U.S. government's use of torture and waterboarding. He pled guilty to leaking the name of a covert agent that he said was torturing detainees. As part of a deal, he's agreed to serve a 30-month prison sentence. John, we're really pleased to have you on the show today. Thanks very much for having me. You bet. And in Washington, D.C., we have Liza Goitin. She is co-director of the Liberty and National Security Program at New York University's Brennan Center for Justice, where she works to make sure that national security policies are in line with constitutional values. Liza, welcome. Thanks very much. John, I want to start with you. You were the first official in the U.S. government to confirm the use of waterboarding of al-Qaeda prisoners as an interrogation technique, and in doing so, you leaked the name of a covert agent. What led to your decision to disclose this information? Well, I felt very strongly about uh, about torture, and there were several things that uh, that caused me to go public. Number one, uh, mm -hmm. there was a, there was an accusation that a uh, that a journalist had levied against me, saying that he had heard that I had tortured Abu Zubaydah, and I said that that was absolutely untrue. I was kind to Abu Zubaydah. I was opposed to torture, and I had nothing to do with Abu Zubaydah's harsh treatment. Um, and secondly, was a, a statement from the White House in 2007 indicating that if there had been torture, it had been the work of rogue CIA officers. That was also untrue. What was true was that torture was an official U.S. government policy, and I thought the American public had the right to know that. So why not come out and just say, I, I know firsthand that it is an official U.S. government policy, but not disclose the name of the, of the CIA agent? Well, the disclosure of the, of the name of the CIA officer, and believe me, I, I regret that very, very much. It was, it was almost an accidental disclosure. A journalist with whom I had been acquainted was writing a book on the CIA's rendition uh, program. He asked me if I knew anyone who he might be able to interview. I said I remembered uh, one person, couldn't remember his last name. The, n the name came to me later in the evening, and the next day I said, here's the guy's name. You might want to talk to him for your book. And that was the crime. 
Jesslyn, the, the current administration is using this World War I era Espionage Act to prosecute John, at least five others. What's the explanation for using this, this old law? Well, it's a very strange one because actually the idea of using the Espionage Act to go after people who've leaked, leaked government secrets came from a neoconservative named Gabe Schoenfeld, who himself is surprised um, by the vigor with which Obama has embraced the strategy of using the Espionage Act to go after sources. Um, Gabe would have them use it to go after journalists and newspapers and publishers as well, um, which I think is a danger. Um, I think Nixon did that unsuccessfully, right, with the New York Times. Right, he did that. Dan Ellsberg was the first person mm -hmm. to be prosecuted under the Espionage Act, and that case was dismissed because of government misconduct. And then Tom Drake um, mm -hmm. became the fourth person in U.S. history to be indicted under that for allegedly mishandling classified information. Um, and I know you talked about leaking classified details, but it turned out that Tom Drake had not leaked anything classified at all or ever possessed classified information. And we should clarify the Tom Drake case for people. In, in right. Tom terms Drake of the was a, a whistleblower for the National Security Agency who complained about a vast, expensive domestic surveillance program that intruded on Americans' privacy um, when there was a constitutional cheap, effective alternative available. Yeah, I think he said, what, it was a $1.3 billion contract that they could have done internally for like three million bucks? That's about right. Yeah. Yes, I think it was even more than $1.3 billion. I think it was mm -hmm. a multi-billion dollar contract that never delivered. Um, well, well, Liza, I want to get you in here because one of the things uh, that's been mentioned is the word leak, and our community has questions about that. I see Mike on Twitter says the difference between whistleblowing and security leaks is attorney language. There's another tweet here that's brought up Bradley Manning, and a lot of our community members have brought this up. Michael says Bradley Manning, a traitor who violated his oath, is being justly prosecuted and spared possible capital punishment for his acts. But there's a video comment here on the other side. Have a listen. Tim Fuller with the Bradley Manning Support Network in New Jersey. The Obama administration frequently leaks national security it wants the people to see to the front page of the New York Times, yet it is equating Bradley Manning's whistleblowing of national security information uh, with treason and terrorism by using the Espionage Act and saying he indirectly aided the enemy when he really wanted to aid the American people by letting them see what their government does behind their backs. So, Liza, what is the difference between whistleblowing uh, and leaking? Well, I think there's actually a spectrum of disclosures of information uh, ranging on the one hand uh, from information that is disclosed for the purpose of harming national security, and that's really what statutes like the Espionage Act uh, were intended to address. And on the other side of the spectrum, you have uh, people who are who have a good faith and reasonable belief that the information that they're disclosing uh, it, it reveals some kind of significant government wrongdoing illegality or fraud waste or abuse and in that situation these people are attempting to do a public service they're attempting to serve their nation not to harm it and then you have everything in between you have releases of information uh, that are negligent but not uh, you know malignant um, and so you know where you think Bradley Manning falls on that spectrum I mean, that's a question we could probably debate all day um, but to be sure we should not be treating people who are at one at the end of that spectrum as if they were at the other end it makes no sense well, well, John, there's uh, actually two tweets here that I want to direct to you. Nathan Fuller says, why the dichotomy? You know, earlier, uh, Jesslyn mentioned Ellsberg, uh, who was responsible for, you know, the, the um, discovery of the Pentagon Papers, shall we say. He says, many see Ellsberg as both. Manning faced much more classified info, released 1%, less than 1% of the docs classified per year. And there's a specific question for you, John. Helen says, what is the impact that Bradley Manning's leaks had on you? They were useful to some of us. Also, his opinion of WikiLeaks. That's directed to you, John. Well, unfortunately, I think Bradley Manning's uh, prosecution has had a, a detrimental effect on my own situation because I think the government tried very hard to to make the public believe that there was uh, that this was the year of the leaker that the, there was there was a, a problem that had to be addressed. And it, it had to be addressed with some immediacy. And um, while I wish Bradley Manning the very best, his case and my case are two completely different uh, situations. 
but it, it did make it hard on me. And then it turned out that um, the judge in my case made a decision that made it even harder on Bradley Manning as well, just recently related to discovery. Jesslyn, we were just talking about these various categories of leaks. And in the category of leaks that politically aid the Obama administration, there are a lot of cases to be made. I mean, there's Stuxnet, there is Obama's secret kill list, and now there's this, you know, lead up to Zero Dark Thirty that sure. puts, you know, the discovery and kill of Osama bin Laden in a very good light. Why aren't people in those cases being prosecuted? Because they are doing things that, that, um, that bolster the image of the administration. Zero Dark Thirty is basically a propaganda piece in which the CIA and the administration willingly cooperated. And by the way, in that process, the Pentagon Inspector General found that a high-level Defense Department um, employee disclosed the name of a covert undercover agent, the exact same thing that John has pled guilty to. And obviously that person is not being prosecuted. In fact, that person's name has been floated as somebody who could head the CIA. I think leaks that embarrass the administration and even worse, leaks that reveal crimes by the administration are the ones that get prosecuted. While ones that um, toe the party line or burnish and the, you know, the, the administration um, get favored treatment, people get book deals. Jose Rodriguez, who ran the entire rendition detention interrogation program, has a book that was approved by the CIA and is out giving book tours. While John, who, pro who tortured nobody, is headed to jail. So I think that's a, a travesty. Let's take a listen to President Obama. This was on his first day in office in 2009. Here's what he had to say then about transparency and government secrets. Starting today, every agency and department should know that this administration stands on the side, not of those who seek to withhold information, but those who seek to make it known. To be sure, issues like personal privacy and national security must be treated with the care they demand. But the mere fact that you have the legal power to keep something secret does not mean you should always use it. John, picking up off of what Jesslyn was just saying in light of the president's comments there in 2009, double standard? Uh oh, I, I can't help but to laugh every time I hear that clip. Um, yes, a, a raging double standard. If, if, you, if you offer up information publicly that makes the administration look good, you're part of the in crowd. If you offer up information that reveals crimes or, or waste or fraud or abuse, then you're, you're in for a long haul uh, through the court system. That's a haul that's going to bankrupt you, that's going to alienate you from your friends and supporters, and it's going to ruin your life. And that's what we've seen in the last four years. Well, Liza, we got a comment uh, left for us via Facebook on this same issue. Uh, Obama, in his first campaign, promised to protect whistleblowers. Is there anyone holding him accountable to what he said? Now, of course, we've seen members of the Senate who have uh, uh, brought up issues related to Stuxnet, the, the worm um, that Lisa mentioned a little bit earlier. But is anyone holding the Obama administration accountable? Well, let's be clear. Uh, the president has extended um, some remarkable protections to whistleblowers in certain contexts. So the president signed the Whistleblower Protection Enhancement Act, which is an incredibly important piece of le legislation, um, which protects whistleblowers except uh, whistleblowers in the intelligence community. Um, even within the intelligence community, the president has in fact extended unprecedented protections to members of those community, members of the intelligence community who report misconduct through approved government channels. And that's really the key, because once uh, people within the intelligence community step outside of those channels and they go to the media, or they go to somebody who doesn't have that internal stamp of approval, then they face uh, ferociously harsh ramifications um, at, at a level that we've never seen from any other administration. So. It's a strange, it's a bit of a schizoid approach when you think about it. Liza, in defense of those exceptions, I want to take a listen to a video comment that we got on why leaks of that type need to be prosecuted. This is Matthew Miller. He's the former spokesperson for the U.S. Department of Justice. 
the administration uh, has no choice but to, to prosecute people for leaks of classified information. Uh, there are times when whistleblowers blow the, the whistle on real government wrongdoing, and those need to be handled differently. But when you look at cases like the case of John Kiriakou, like the case of Jeffrey Sterling, who disclosed important government secrets, uh, those things are kept secret for a reason, because their disclosure could harm national security. Jocelyn, what about that? I mean, the U.S. government has a right to prosecute people who disclose classified information. Sure, and, and there are actually laws set up to do that. Um, there are laws for revealing classified information. Matthew Miller initially said Thomas Drake was the worst of the bad, but then later said, oh, well, Thomas Drake is actually a whistleblower. Maybe we shouldn't have prosecuted that case. So, you know, it's hard to take what he says at face value. I agree. If people are revealing classified information, including sources and methods, um, nuclear design information, things like that, that should be prosecuted. But when you have people revealing much more than that on the front pages of the, of the New York Times um, and in movies in Hollywood um, and in many other contexts in terms of authorized leaks, which to me is an oxymoron, I think that's a big problem. In terms of protections, I don't see any protections that have come out of this administration for national security and intelligence. Part of the problem with reporting it up your chain of command is if your chain of command is dirty and they're the ones committing the illegal activity, like in the case of Tom Drake, same in the case of the torture program. There is a reason President Obama gave all the CIA agents blanket immunity at the outset. It's because what they did was a crime. John, do you feel like more than just your prosecution in particular that you're being made an example of to prevent yeah. other people from oh, disclosing information? I think, I think practically any journalist involved in national security reporting will tell you that my case has had a, a very significant chilling effect and that their national security sources have dried up, which is a shame because it's those national security sources that report on waste, fraud, abuse, and illegality. I, I want to say another thing, too, and, and this really comes to the crux of, of your last question. National security cases, true national security cases, should be prosecuted. And as Jessalyn has pointed out, there are laws to prosecute those cases, not the antiquated, probably unconstitutional 1917 Espionage Act, but, but more specific and more modern laws that were written for that purpose. But if you're going to prosecute national security cases um, involve, involving leaks, you have to do it across the board. It can't be a selective or a selective and vindictive prosecution. You, then you're going to have to, if you're going to prosecute Jeffrey Sterling or John Kiriakou, you also have to prosecute maybe a former CIA director who possibly gave his, his girlfriend classified information or Navy SEALs who have profited uh, by their positions as Navy SEALs and leaked information to video game makers or or who have written books and uh, didn't bother to get them cleared. I mean, there are any number of cases involving leaks of classified information, sources and methods that were not prosecuted. And I think they weren't prosecuted for political reasons. So, John, being completely fair, would you say then that you deserve to be prosecuted for leaking the name of a covert CIA agent? The problem is that others who did equal or worse haven't been? No, frankly, I don't think I should have been prosecuted. Um, the the so-called leak uh, uh, was a private conversation with somebody who was looking to interview uh, a, um, a former colleague of mine. That name was never made public. Uh, I think that because I came out against waterboarding in 2007, the Justice Department was looking, or had been looking since 2007, for something with which to prosecute me, and, and they found it. The, the irony of this is that the name revealed by John Kiriakou is a name of a torturer and someone who did really bad stuff. Also, that name was well known to a number of human rights journalists and activists. It, that name was not really that covert. 
And now, because of this case, nobody was paying attention to the name, but ironically, because the government insisted on prosecuting it, now a bunch of people are writing about that name and it's all over the place. Um, so in a way, the government has, you know, has a self-inflicted wound here um, by going after people like John Kiriakou, when in reality, maybe it should have gone after the people who committed torture. And in Tom Drake's case, maybe it should have gone after the people who engaged in warrantless wiretapping rather than the guy who reported it. The two biggest scandals of my generation, namely torture and secret surveillance without a warrant, the only people to have been prosecuted for those are the people who blew the whistle on them. Liza, I know you want to jump in. Yeah, I just wanted to bring up a, a background piece of information that I think is very important here. Um, there's a premise behind what Matthew Miller said and, and what you hear often that uh, th the release of classified information is very harmful to national security um, and the only issue is why do we sometimes prosecute it and sometimes not. Um, but the, the key fact here is that most classified information should not have been classified in the first place. And that's not just my assessment. That is the assessment of high level military and intelligence officials from administrations across the political spectrum who have come before Congress to testify that anywhere from 50 to 90% of classified documents could safely be released. So this idea that, oh, we have to prosecute this person because he or she released classified information, it, 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 it ignores this key fact of overclassification, which, which underlies all of this. True, but if we're, if we're going to get down to splitting hairs here, you've got to operate within the law. And if the law says that those are classified documents, then they're classified documents. And if they shouldn't be classified, then it should go through the proper channels to declassify them. But you can't have rogue government employees deciding what should be classified and what shouldn't. And first of all, I want to say that there really are no effective procedures right now to locate and declassify wrongly classified information. So the whistleblower who runs across evidence of uh, serious government illegality or misconduct, that whistleblower does not have the option of just getting it declassified, especially, especially if it was classified for the purpose of hiding the misconduct. So these sort of inside solutions don't necessarily exist. But the other thing I want to say is I do think it is a very tricky question how to handle improperly classified information, you know, short of deputizing people to make their own decisions. That, it's very difficult to figure out what to do. It's very easy to figure out what not to do. And what we shouldn't be doing is going after the people who reveal government wrongdoing just because it happens to have been classified perhaps wrongly, as if they were enemies of the state or spies. I mean, that is not what we should be doing. So and, let's and John, picking up question. on that, there's actually a tweet here, a direct question to you. What about your personal safety now? Are you safe? Abdullah on Twitter asks. To be perfectly honest with you, I, I fear my government a lot more than I fear outside groups. John, yeah, John is under active surveillance. Even though he's already pled guilty, he is still under active surveillance. Um, he's been bankrupted blacklisted his family has been on food stamps they've moved out of their house he his wife was pushed Fired out of the while CIA she was pregnant. while she was pregnant even though she had nothing to do well with that is case. something I want to get into John and I know we're running a short of time in the show so we'll talk sure. about it in our in our online post show but this idea that insiders are reporting increasing use of extra legal methods this intimidation yes. and things that, that you know bankrupting families emotionally and certainly financially um, to keep them quiet or to somehow punishment, punish them if they're not going through legal channels to punish them. So we're going to get into that in the post show. Um, but for now, this is the end of the TV portion of our program. So thanks to all of our guests. We're hoping that you're going to join us to continue this conversation online. To do so, log on to stream.aljazeera.com. Now on Monday, 40 years have passed since the U.S. Supreme Court granted women the constitutional right to abortion. However, with increasing state restrictions, is it becoming harder for a woman to get an abortion today than 40 years ago? Send us your thoughts on that. Until then, we'll see you online.
Welcome back. This is the Streams Online Post Show. We're talking about the Obama administration's actions against government whistleblowers and those who leak state secrets, whether there's a double standard within the administration, things that benefit the administration are leaked with no consequence, things that don't benefit the administration, people are pursued aggressively uh, via this 1917 Espionage Act. I want to get back to what we were talking about. John Kiriakou, um, Tom Drake, who was an NSA employee who revealed some very disturbing mismanagement of funds, among other things, in the U.S. government. He said that he had his home raided at gunpoint. He was forced out of his job. He called it the politics of personal destruction, where marriages were strained, bank accounts strained. He was blacklisted. He was bankrupted. I want you to talk a little bit about that, this increasing use of extra legal methods and intimidation against employees who speak out. I, I think that's all part of the government's plan, frankly. Um, the plan is not just to prosecute you. The plan is to personally ruin you. Um, in my own personal case, uh, my wife was forced out of her job um, where she had been one of the CIA's senior most uh, analysts. And, um, and she was unemployed for 10 months after the loss of that job. I was unemployed, of course, from the day of my arrest onward. Uh, we ran up nearly a million dollars in legal bills that I don't know how I'll ever repay. Finally, in July, uh, we had a conversation one night where she said, I'm not sure how we're going to buy food next week. And we had to go on public assistance for three months. Um, I'm unemployed and unemployable. Uh, I bring no income into the family. Uh, many of my friends have abandoned me because I'm too controversial, especially my friends from the intelligence community. And, uh, and I'm on my own. As Jessalyn pointed out a few minutes ago, too, I'm constantly the subject of FBI surveillance. Um, just a couple of days ago, they followed me to four different uh, errands that I ran around town and then broke off. But they'll follow me into um, restaurants, uh, into my children's school. They followed me into church one Sunday and sent two agents in to sit behind me in church. What they thought I was going to do in church, I have no idea. But it's all part of the intimidation, part of the harassment, and part of this plan to break you and, and to make you just throw up your hands and give up. Take a plea just to make it all go away. Would you say that this is unprecedented aggression that we're seeing toward whistleblowers? Well, definitely unprecedented aggression. I mean, in terms of what I went through, as horrible as it was to be blacklisted and forced out of my job and put on the no-fly list, at least, even though I was criminally investigated, at least I was never indicted. Um, but by indicting people and doing so under the Espionage Act, you make them radioactive. You alienate them from people who would be their natural allies in the good government community and the whistleblower organizations and civil liberties groups are suddenly like, wow, wait, he's charged with harming our country or benefiting a foreign nation. But these people are whistleblowers. They're not Robert Hansen. They're not Aldrich Ames. Um, and to put them under the same category is ridiculous, particularly when there are other laws like 798 and 1924, other laws that are available to prosecute the unauthorized disclosure of classified information, where the penalties range from administrative to criminal, but certainly not charging them under under the Espionage Act. And, and certainly people within DOJ disagree. In fact, in a recent Department of Justice memo on John's case, they said that he, quote, seeks to claim the misbegotten title of whistleblower. Such a claim should be squarely rejected and considered as a repudiation of his acceptance of responsibility for the criminal conduct that he committed. And then again, on the same subject, this is another comment from Matthew Miller, who's the former Department of Justice spokesperson. The idea that John Kiriakou is a whistleblower uh, is a myth that's contradicted by his own statements. Uh, he didn't blow the whistle on anything. He did interviews with the press uh, to defend waterboarding, to say that waterboarding was something the U.S. government needed to do. Uh, the only thing he's being prosecuted for is not for, for any disclosure about waterboarding. It's for disclosure, disclosing the confidential name of a covert CIA operative, something that could have put this person uh, in very real danger. And that's something the government just simply cannot uh, afford to, to look the other way for. John, are you a whistleblower? Uh, you know, in the beginning, um, I didn't think that I was. I, I've come to learn that there's a certain psychology behind whistleblowing where no whistleblower realizes that he's a whistleblower. But I've learned that there is a legal definition of whistleblower, and yes, I meet that legal definition. Now, what Matthew Miller won't tell you 
is that the whole reason why the Justice Department began this investigation um, was because I blew the whistle on torture. The Justice Department would never have investigated me if I had not blown the whistle on torture. And they just happened to be able to build up enough of a case to force this into the into the court process. Now, I want to say another thing, too. It's not up to the prosecutors or up to Matthew Miller to decide who's a whistleblower. Absolutely. Not at all. Like yes. I say, there's a definition. As I a whistleblower a lawyer, it is not, the government doesn't get to determine who's a whistleblower. Matthew mm -hmm. Miller certainly doesn't get to determine that. You become a whistleblower through operation of law by making a disclosure that you reasonably believe evidences fraud, waste, abuse, or illegality. Matthew Miller conveniently neglects to mention that from the time John went public about torture, he had been misled by his own agency and told that waterboarding worked. Um, and that a, a subject cracked after a few seconds rather than was boarded, waterboarded 83 times, and that the government had filed six different crimes reports. The CIA had filed those with the Department, Department of Justice. They were clearly gunning for John because every time he opened his mouth, they filed a crimes report. Mm -hmm. And that's not about justice, that's about politics. Well, Liza, I want to bring you in here and shift gears a bit and talk about the role of the media in this. Christian on Twitter says Obama's assault on whistleblowers, as he calls it, has a chilling effect on free speech and press and is a tactic to stifle democratic dissent. Another tweet from Rawaida who says the law also affects future journalists who want to go into the field and, of course, I'd argue future public servants. And it instills fear rather than finding truth. I wonder if you can talk about that, but also uh, on the role of the media maybe in being complicit and in, in, in the fact that we've heard a lot about Bradley Manning's case, maybe not so much about John's case. That's an interesting point uh, that the, of the media being complicit. I think the media is actually pretty alarmed at, at what's going on with these prosecutions of whistleblowers. I think they're very concerned about it. So uh, have they been as energetic as they should have been in covering these stories? I mean, uh, probably not. Um, but I, I complicit is a difficult word because I think they see themselves as the next likely victim, essentially. I think they're pretty worried. Um, you know, I, in terms of um, stifling, you know, the flow of information to the media and whether this is actually the point, you know, I, it's hard to know what's in the president's mind, right? I, I, I can't really pretend to know that. The sense that I get is that when he talks about bringing an unprecedented level of transparency to government, there is an asterisk in there for national security matters. And that asterisk for him is a matter of ideology, that he seems to actually believe that the right course of action with national security information is to clamp down and be very secretive. And as I said before, I think he thinks that he's drawn the right line by saying we're going to permit and encourage authorized disclosures of information through government channels. Um, and then we're going to punish very strictly unauthorized disclosures to John the media. And, I, mean, I think he probably believes that he's he's walking the right line there, but clearly the effect is to stifle the, the free flow of information to the media. John, we've got less than a minute left. I, I want you to wrap things up for us and, and answer this for me. You know, you're set to serve 30 months in prison. You've got a campaign of people uh, seeking a commutation for you. How likely do you think that is and what are you prepared for right now? I don't think it is likely. I, I still hold out some hope that uh, the president will do the right thing. Uh, but despite the fact that I have great support, uh, you know, across uh, the wide variety of, uh, of political ideologies, um, the reality is that in the first term, uh, there were 3,501 requests for commutation and President Obama granted one. Uh, and that was to a woman dying of leukemia. So I don't hold out great hope that my sentence will be commuted. Um, I, I hope that it will be still, but I don't expect it. All right. John Kiriakou, Jesslyn Raddick, and uh, Liza Goitin, thank you so much for joining us today, and thanks to everyone for participating in our online community. Now, on Monday's show, 40 years have passed since the U.S. Supreme Court granted women a constitutional right to abortion. However, with increasing state restrictions, is it becoming harder for a woman to get an abortion today than 40 years ago? Send us your thoughts on that, and until then, we'll see you online.